Prime 3 stands for Premier Third Generation Voting Technology. First generation would be mechanical things, paper, pencil, lever machines. Second generation would be what we call DREs, or direct recording equipment, or touchscreen computers. Now, third generation is universal voting technology, meaning technology designed once and used by multiple people. So Prime 3 was created over a decade ago, and the motivation behind it started right here in Florida in 2000. Some of you probably remember that. <laughs> Presidential election, right? And what was the issue? Well, this was part of it. The punch card system. You take a pen and you punch a hole, and as you can see, a piece of paper falls, which we call the Chad. Well, that didn't work out so well. And this is the culprit. It's called the butterfly ballot. So in 2000, the presidential contest, if you notice here, Al Gore is second on the left, but the punch hole is the third hole in the middle. The second punch hole corresponds to Pat Buchanan. So what happened? There were people leaving thinking, did I vote for Pat Buchanan? I meant to vote for Al Gore. They didn't know. Well, some of you probably remember this. We had hanging chads. And counting these, people would ask, is that a vote or not? Why would that happen? Even worse, the pregnant chad. <laughs> what does that mean? How do you interpret that? Why would anybody do such a thing? Well, this system was designed where you punch through, the chads will fall, and it falls into a tray. If you don't empty the tray, they stack up, and then you can't punch through. So because it was a close, close election, what did we do? We have to audit it. And this just demonstrates <laughs> how impossible it is to count ballots in this way. This is not going to work. So what did we do? This great country said, this is unacceptable presidential election. So the government stepped up, and the government said, well, we're going to have in 2002 the Help America Vote Act. So money was appropriated so states could go buy new equipment. We're going to move into the next generation of voting. And what did we do? We bought DREs, direct recording equipment, where you touch and it stores your vote, and it's on the machine, and to get a tally, you just go later and say, give me the tally. Well, these didn't work out so well either. It was shortly after these hit the market that professors were able to demonstrate that I could actually change your vote after you cast it, and you wouldn't know it. People were hacking these. People were having issues with them with respect to allegations of vote flipping. I touched Barack Obama and it flipped to John McCain. How could that happen? There were poor issues here in ballot design. So what did we do? We said, OK, we may have moved too quickly into this area. So we're going to go to the you know, thing we're confident about. And we moved from DREs to optical scan and paper. The idea was that this is easy. We were in middle school, and you just fill in the oval, and you just scan that thing. Everybody can do it, right? This is easy. Well, optical scan didn't work out that well. Minnesota 2008, Al Franken and Norm Coleman were Senate, running for Senate. And they spent millions of dollars on lawyers trying to figure out who won this contest. Well, what happened? They were using optical scan. This is what happened. Look at this ballot. This particular ballot, a human would look at it and say, oh, they probably meant to vote for Norm Coleman. But the machine, there's no filled in oval. I don't know who they voted for. The machine probably said nobody. This one, a little squiggly there. Why would anybody do that? <laughs> well, it turns out that this was done typically by older adults, seniors, 
who couldn't steady the pencil to get it in that little oval that was so easy when we were in middle school. So I don't know how this turned out. People probably said Al Franklin. But what about this one? The machine probably registered Norm Coleman, but then there was an argument because they wrote Al Franken on the same ballot. And then it gets worse. <laughs> Enough said, right? So we had a catastrophic event. Optical scan failed. And we've seen elections where we threw out more ballots than the margin of victory. So this became very frustrating, and we need a new improvement in technology. So it was in 2003, I was at a conference with a group of my students, and there was a speaker talking about electronic voting. The speaker got up and said, well, we can't do voting because you can hack it, it won't work, this is bad, no, no, no. So I looked over at my students, and they had this just horrible look on their face. I said, what's the matter? They said, look, I went to graduate school to get a PhD because I thought we fix problems. We don't just break things. So now I'm an advisor. I'm in an awkward position, right? So what do I do? I said, well, you're right. So let's go to the lab and fix it. So we had a new project at that point. This is in 2003, so the first version of Prime 3 was created. We went to the lab, and we came up with this idea on how to fix voting, to get rid of all the hanging chads and the stray marks, and then make it accessible for people with disabilities as well. So over a decade ago, we started down this journey. So Prime 3 was designed with the intention of not having separate but equal. So the Help America Vote Act had written into it that every precinct voting place would have at least one accessible voting machine. So if you have a disability, you vote here. If you don't, you vote over here. We thought separate but equal would not work in this scenario. And at that time, conventional wisdom said you cannot create one machine that everyone votes on. This is what conventional wisdom was. So we dare to differ. So how does this work? It starts with a single sheet of paper. You take a blank piece of paper and you put it in a printer. And then a poll worker would initiate the machine so you can vote. And how do you vote? Well, you vote by touching a screen and you can vote by using a headset with a microphone and responding to prompts, speaking to it. So when we created Prime 3, what happens is you, you touch, speak, interchangeably, you don't have to say which one, and then it prints this ballot when you're done. If you notice, this ballot prints only the contest and who you voted for. And I put a picture up there to demonstrate we can put pictures on the ballot, and I'll talk about that in a second. And it has the candidate's ID. So now this ballot is unique in that there's no ambiguity about whom I'm voting for. It's easy for a person to look at this and get the selections. So this ballot now goes into the ballot box. And then after that, we put it through a scanner. Imagine a copy machine where it's just scanning and take a picture of it. Take a picture of every ballot. And then we have software that can read those images or pictures and convert it into text and tally the, the election. That's how it works. So again, when we created Prime 3, we didn't realize it, but we had created the world's most accessible voting machine. Meaning if you can't see, if you can't hear, if you can't read, if you don't have arms, you can privately, independently vote on the same machine as anyone else. One machine, just one machine for everyone to vote on. So we didn't know what we had done. We just thought this is gonna work, but we'll, we'll see. So what did we do? Being researchers and scientists, we said, OK, we built it in a lab. Let's take it to the field. So we went to test it and conduct studies. We went to the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind. You can see my team that was there that day. And on, on the left and on the right, you'll see a young woman voting with a headset on. 
and she's blind. Now, in this test, it was fascinating. You could see where she's holding the, the headset because it was kind of loud there. Well, that was a problem because we were getting feedback in the system. And we had a woman that showed up and just kept coming back. And it was loud and interfering, and they were struggling. So I asked her, I said, well, you keep coming back. Why are you doing this? She said, this is the first time in my life I've ever been at a vote by myself. So at that moment, we said, well, wait a minute. Maybe we're on to something here. So we went back to the lab, made some adjustments, and kept testing. We did a test at the National Council on Independent Living. We did their national election two years. Um, so that's an organization of people who have various disabilities. So we had people in wheelchairs, blind people, deaf people, all coming in voting on this one machine. Then we went to SAVE, Self Advocates Becoming Empowered. This was a very instrumental point in our development. So with SAVE, these individuals have cognitive disabilities. So we knew if we took this election, we would be facing a situation where people would be all over the reading literacy scale, but we could not ask them about their reading literacy. So that was when we discovered that, what if we put pictures on the ballot? So we put pictures on the ballot, and we did the election, and we let people come in and vote. We had over 230 people vote, and we could not determine anyone's reading literacy. They had no problem. What we discovered was that they were actually voting using the pictures. So we weren't too confident in that. This was in 2012, actually. So we said, we need to do another test. So we went to an elementary school, and we let kids do a mock election the week before the presidential election. And we knew those kids could not read. They hadn't been taught to read yet. And they were able to vote. They voted Barack Obama as president. And we were in South Carolina, and the parents wanted a recount. <laughs> <laughs> that was on a Thursday, and the election was that Tuesday, and he won. And they said, never mind, we'll drop it. So the kids had accurately voted and picked the president. So the pictures were very powerful. So we did save. We went to Oregon in 2012 as well. Uh, in this election, we had, this is a rehabilitation center where people would come in and vote because um, Oregon's a mail-in state. So they mail you a ballot, you fill it out, you mail it back. But they would, in these rehab centers, they would come use Prime 3, print a ballot, and mail it in. So we had success in Oregon. 2014, we went to Wisconsin. Uh, two precincts there used it in April of 2014. Um, that was off-the-shelf components. And then, New Hampshire. In 2014, the state of New Hampshire used Prime 3 in two elections, September and then in November in the midterm election. As you can see, this is a setup from New Hampshire. You see, they had a Dell tablet that they leased on a state contract. You can see the headset, the printer, and they had a two-button switch there. So if you hit the right side, it goes next to the next thing to the next thing. Hit the left side, select. New Hampshire used it in 2014 and said, wow, this thing works. They said, can you guys help us do this in 2016, statewide? We said, yeah, I think. <laughs> now, the caveat here about New Hampshire was that this was the first election we did, and we did not go. They just used the software. Prime 3 is open source. We give it away. So they just used it, and we never showed up. They ran the election. These are our partners. You'll see voting companies in here, universities, uh, technology companies, and government. Prime 3 has been supported by a lot of entities. We have several partners. And then moving forward, we went to New Hampshire 2016. They're going to go statewide, and New Hampshire be the first presidential primary, and they'll be voting using our technology. Florida is reviewing Prime 3 right now to give us access to test here. 
got a call from Ohio saying, we heard about this thing you got. By the way, you know, we're running out of HAVA money, Help America Vote Act money. What are we going to do? This guy's giving this stuff away for free. Maybe we could use it. We'll be in California this week. So if you look at Prime 3, over a decade's worth of work so far, in 2003, I sat in a room with a group of students who said, this isn't right. We should be fixing things, not just breaking them and telling people what they can't do. That moment created a breakthrough that all of you may someday vote using this technology just from that talk. If you had asked me, you know, 10 years ago, what's going to happen with Prime 3? You guys are doing this. I thought this is a lab project. We'll, you know, maybe publish some papers and test it and see, see what happens. I didn't think it was going to be a breakthrough in a way that it could change the way voting is done in the United States of America. Thank you.